I'm going to record the session. It's going to record all of the audio and everything that shows up on the screen. Now, the reason I got all this stuff on here is because I just finished a trig session with somebody. You probably recognize all of this stuff since you took trig last year. Yeah, it looks familiar. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, here's the way these work. If you can verbalize a problem, in other words, if you told me, okay, the function is y equal x cubed, what is y prime, that's stuff you can verbalize. And then we can solve it. Okay? If it's a really complicated function, which you're probably dealing with now, or if it's some sort of a graph that they want you to interpret, then what you need to do, and we probably should get this out of the way right now, and that is send, take a picture with your cell phone of whatever the material is you want to cover. Just like if I was there in person, you'd bring it out of your notebook. Well, I want you to bring it out of your notebook and take a picture of it and send it to this email address. And then I will pull it up on the screen and we'll be good to go. And then we can just proceed. Let's do this. Okay. Let's do it at least one time because once you've done it once, then the next time is really easy because as soon as you type in DA, it remembers what the full email address was. So it's only the first time that it's a bit difficult. And we want to make sure that we get past this step. We'll start with the worksheet. <laughs> okay, yeah. Just take one picture only and send it to that email address. And are you using your iPhone? Yeah. Make sure you attach it as a large image. Don't send it in the body of the email, but send it as an attached file. And once, you've, once it says sent, let me know and I'll start checking my emails. It usually only takes a few seconds to get to me once it says send or sent on your phone. You want to hold the camera about a foot away from the paper. You want to make sure you have pretty good light, and you want to hold it as steady as possible when you take the picture. If there's too much shaking going on, then it comes out blurry, and it's hard to read on my end. I don't know how to attach a file. <laughs> Hmm. Well, go ahead and send it any way you know how. We'll see what comes through. Unfortunately, I do not have an iPhone, so I don't quite know how to do it on an iPhone. I have a Samsung, and but all my students have iPhones. I mean, all of them. Uh, it's just that I never know precisely how to tell them how to send the picture. Most of them know how to send a picture. Have you ever sent a picture to anybody's email address? Yeah. Do that. Whatever you did, do that. Okay, I got it. Now let's have a look at it. Okay, there's two attachments. Which one do you want to start on? The one on the left or the one on the right? Um, let's do the first page, so the one on the left. Okay, so let me download that, blow it up, and then I can rotate it. And there we have it. Almost, not quite. Hold on. Okay. And I can zoom in, and... Alright, so where do you want to start? So what are we looking at? We're looking at the function on the left and its derivative on the right. Okay. 
You want to start? You want me to just check your answers that you've done here? And let's talk. Shall we start from one? Yeah, let's check one. Okay. So for what values of X is F increasing? So I think that's like where the... Um... Remember, you're looking at the x-axis. So it's actually increasing from negative infinity to minus 2. That's the interval that's increasing. Right? Oh, uh, it's not... Oh, uh, wait. So because... Because it's, Even though always, it's, like curving. it's always going up. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what that curve down at the lower left means, but you can assume that that goes all the way down to negative infinity and all the way out to negative infinity. Okay? So, okay. oh, I see why you made it minus 5 to minus 2. Okay, now I get it. You're not that wrong because we don't really know what's going on on the other side of this curve. It might go back up again. Who knows? So actually, your answer is actually correct, and it's also increasing from 0 to 2. So that means that on F prime, we've got to be positive from minus 5 to minus 2, are we? Yes, we are. F, okay. F prime is in positive territory when X is between minus 5 and minus 2. You see that? Wait, so when it's don't, F don't, is... think about, don't think about it being increasing or decreasing. Just think about it being positive or negative. What is it in this area right here? The Y value is positive. In other words, F prime is positive. Oh, okay, so y value, not that. Okay. Correct. The x in, in the interval, in the x interval from minus 5 to minus 2, the original function is increasing, and its derivative is positive. Well, we know that that has to go together. Increasing from a function equates to positive to the first derivative. Now let's look where it's decreasing. Where is it decreasing? The original function. Um, from negative 2 to 0. Okay, now let's look at the derivative function. What's happening from negative 2 to 0? Are we positive or negative? Negative. So everywhere the original function is increasing, the derivative is positive. Everywhere it's decreasing, the derivative is negative. Notice the derivative turns positive again at 0 and stays positive until x is 2. Well, the original function is increasing from 0 to 2. And then as the original function starts decreasing again, the first derivative goes negative. Now, notice where the first derivative is 0. It's 0 right here at minus 2. What's the slope of the tangent line of the original function? At minus 2. Negative. No, the slope of the tangent line, if I draw a tangent line across that peak, it's got a 0 slope. At negative 2. Yeah, go to negative 2 on the original function, not the... Oh, okay. Function, the original function, go to negative 2, put a tangent line on the curve, and what's the slope of that tangent line? Zero. What's the slope of the tangent line here at, at x equals zero? Uh, zero. What's the slope of the tangent line at x equal 2? Zero. Ah. So if we go over to the derivative function, we're going to find three zeros there. We got a zero at minus two, right? F prime is zero at x equal minus two. 
Oh, yeah. Where, where I'm right. pointing, okay? It's also zero at x equals zero. Well, the slope of the tangent line was zero. It's also zero at x equal two. Slope of the tangent line is zero at x equal two. In other words, wherever the tangent line, whatever its slope is, is reflected in this first derivative, always. If I examine minus 4 on the original function, you see where I'm pointing? Yeah. Slope of that tangent line looks to be about 2 or 3 or 4, right? Positive? Well, go over to the derivative function. Go to minus 4. F prime is equal to 3. That's the slope of that tangent line at minus 4. That's what first derivative is. is. It's a continuous plot of the changing of the slope of the tangent line. In other words, if I start right here on this function on the left, and I start looking at the slopes of the tangent line, I got positive, 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 zero, negative, 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 zero, positive, 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 and so forth. And that's how I get my f prime. If I wasn't doing it algebraically, I could do it graphically. You with me? Yeah. Okay, now let's answer some more of these questions. What kind of values, positive or negative, are taken on by f prime on those intervals? Well, positive is correct, and we've shown that. For what values of x is f prime negative? From minus 2 to 0, correct. And from 2 to 5, correct. What is the behavior increasing or decreasing of f on those intervals? Decreasing is correct. For what values of x is f prime increasing? Now, this is different. So far, all they ask you about is when f was increasing and decreasing. Now, they're asking you about f prime. So, what interval is f prime increasing on? Start from the left. We'll just go through all of them. What's the first interval that it's increasing on? Um, and give me the x values. So x equals 5? No, it's increasing from minus 5 to right about minus, uh, to to minus, four and a half. minus 3 and a half. Two. I don't know what that number is, but it's close to minus 3 and a half. So it's increasing on that interval. It's decreasing. Well, what, what's the next interval it's increasing on? On negative 1 to 0, or negative 1 to 1. Correct. And finally, what's the last interval it's increasing on? Uh, 3 and a half to 5. Yeah, you got it. Now you got it. So if I wanted, I could draw a graph of f double prime, right? And is all I would do is make the graph of f double prime be the first derivative of f prime. In other words, wherever f prime is increasing, f double prime is positive. Wherever f prime is decreasing, f double prime is negative. Now, so we've got the intervals where f prime is increasing. You know what concavity means. Uh, let's, talk, beef. let's talk about concavity for a moment. If I have a curve over here, let me draw a curve. And I have something that looks like this. Okay. 
concave down, here's the point where it changes from concave down to concave up. In other words, to the left of my dotted line, it's concave down everywhere. All of this is concave down. To the right of my dotted line, it's concave up everywhere. The point that they switch, that is called the what? The saddle point. The inflection point. Okay, that is called the inflection point. Think of, you know what inflection means in terms of voice? No. If I talk really low and go really high, somewhere in between there was an inflection point where I changed it. If the second derivative is equal to zero, that is an inflection point. Let me bring up something I want to show you. I've wanted to show you this for a long time. And I've never had it with me. I think I brought it over one time. Um, and I want to show it to you because it's so good at explaining the difference between function, first derivative, and second derivative. Just got to find it. Perfect. Look at these three curves. This is the way they should be shown, one under another, because you see all of the key stuff this way. This is the function. The top one is the function, and it's even spelled out, but it doesn't really matter what the function is. The middle one is the first derivative. The bottom one is the second derivative. Let's examine it. When the original function is increasing, what is the first derivative? Positive or negative? Negative. Look at it. When the original function is increasing, the first derivative is in positive territory. You're saying negative because you see it decreasing. Do not confuse increasing, decreasing with positive and negative. They're not the same thing. The original function's y value is positive. Everywhere, excuse me, the first derivative's function is positive everywhere that the original function is increasing. Notice that it's increasing until that dotted line, right? Yeah. And then it starts decreasing to the next dotted line. Well, what happens to the first derivative? What is the first derivative between those dotted lines? Positive or negative? Negative. Negative. And that's the relationship that always has to exist. When the original function turns around and starts increasing again, first derivative gets back into positive territory. Forget the fact that it's increasing. That's not what's important. What's important is that it's in positive territory. Now examine the second derivative. Notice that if we think of the function as being the middle graph, and the bottom as being the first derivative of the middle graph follows all the same rules. When the first derivative is decreasing, the second derivative is negative, completely negative, in negative territory. When the first derivative is flat, second derivative is zero. See that dotted line that goes from where the tangent line would be horizontal? That's a zero yeah. point. In fact, let's go back to the original function and find all of the points on here where the slope of the tangent line is zero. Well, right there is one. Notice first derivative is zero. Right there is one. Notice first derivative is zero. Now, look at where the inflection point. Can you see where I'm pointing? Yeah. That's the inflection point between the original function being concave down and switching to concave up. 
Can you, can you notice the concavity? Do you see why it's concave down to the left and concave up to the right? Wait, down to the left? To the left of my cursor, it's concave down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To the right of my cursor, it's concave up. The point where it changes is the inflection point, and that's also the point where the second derivative is zero. If I drop my cursor straight down to the second derivative, I'm right there on that zero point. The second derivative is zero at the inflection point of the original function. So you've got these relationships between original function, first derivative, and second derivative. And that's pretty much, let's say we wanted to find out what that value on the x-axis was and what this value on the x-axis was. Okay, you with me? Yep. Take the first derivative, set it equal to zero, and I find those two values. Right? Make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Now I have to decide which value is a local maximum and which value is a local minimum. That's based on concavity. If the first value is concave down, then that's a maximum, right? A local maximum means that it is surrounded by points that are all lower than it. A local minimum means that it's surrounded by points that are all higher than it. When you, okay. take, when you take the first derivative of the function and you set it equal to zero, you're going to find two places where it's equal to zero, here and here. The next thing you have to determine is are we looking at a maximum there or a minimum? Well, that's based on the second derivative. If you take the second derivative and it's concave down, it's negative. So if the second derivative is negative, then that's a maximum. If the second derivative is positive, it means the original function is concave up, which means it must be a negative. In other words, if something is concave up, it's a minimum. If it's concave down, it's a maximum. Let me just draw a picture to show you exactly what I mean. This point right here, that's a local maximum. And it's concave down, right? So if this was f, and I took the second derivative of it, and evaluated it at this point right here, it would be negative it reflects the concavity, the second derivative does. When the second derivative is negative, you are looking at an original function that is concave down. That's pretty easy to remember because down goes with negative, right? When the original function is concave up, the second derivative is going to be positive. Positive goes with concave up. Now, the fact is, is that concave down goes with a maximum and concave up goes with a minimum. So if you want to know whether a point that you found with the first derivative is a maximum or a minimum, do the second derivative test. And then check to see whether that point is positive or negative and you will find out whether you're dealing with a minimum or a maximum. Now let's get back to your questions. So let's answer number six. What is the behavior, meaning what is the concavity of f on these intervals where f prime is increasing? Hold on. They don't really mean that, do they? 
for what values of x is f prime increasing? Okay, here's what they're asking for number six. They're asking for the concavity of f. That, and that's just... Tell wait. me the concavity of f from some point right there from minus 4 to some point right there. From minus 4 to minus 1. What kind of concavity is that? Concave up. Look at it. Is that concave up or concave down? Where are my cursors pointing? That's concave down. Here. If I draw a parabola, is that concave up or down? Concave down? No, look at it. It points up. Whichever way the curvature points, it's concave up. If I want concave down, it's going to look like that. So over here, on this curve here, all this area is concave down. All of this area in blue is concave up. You see why? Okay, so I had it backwards. Yeah. It just depends on where the curve goes up. The concavity is very important, and concavity is a function of the second derivative. So this is really the very first time we've found something really powerful with the second derivative. It tells you about concavity. And the point where the concavity changes is the inflection point, right there. So let me draw some concavity here. I'm going to draw a function, and I'm going to put lots of concavity in it, and I'm going to have you tell me where let me tell you just to be clear first of all let me put inflection points in red there's an inflection point right there that's where the concavity changes there's another one right there the concavity changes there's another one right there. The concavity changes. Now, what is the concavity to the left of my green line? Down. Good. What is the concavity between my green and my blue line? Up. Concavity between my blue line and the red line. Down. And the concavity of the rest of it? Up. That's got a down arrow there. That's got an up arrow there. That's got a down arrow there. That's got an up arrow there. What's the concavity way over there on the right? Infinity? No, still up. No, okay. It hasn't turned yet. In other words, there's some inflection point. If I were to scroll up, which obviously I can't do because I didn't draw it right, I mean, let's pretend that that function does this and turns back around. Well, now there's some point there that's an inflection point that separates concave up from concave down. No matter how I draw a function, I'm always going to have any place on the function, I can tell you whether it's concave up or concave down. Let me draw some. This is, this is pretty important. Um, to that point there, what are we? Con wait. 
concave up? No. Which way would you point the arrow if I was going to draw an arrow in there? You'd point it away from the curvature, right? Always. In other words, I'm going to finish drawing the line. If I had to point an arrow here, it would point that way, right? I'm, I'm yeah. point, my arrow points in the direction that the concavity points. This concavity points down. This concavity points up. Well, that means there's some point between the two that is the inflection point. And it's approximately there. And you, you need to be able to see that everywhere there is concave down. Everywhere. Everywhere here is concave up including way over here at the right. It hasn't turned around yet. If I should do this, now it's turned around. Now there's an inflection point right there, and that part is concave down again. One more example that is interesting. If I plot y equal x cubed, Looks like that. Where is it concave down? Between what x values? Between negative 3 and 0. Good. Where is it concave up? Zero and three. You understand now? Yeah. Concavity? Because so. you've got to understand concavity. You're not going to get through any more difficult calculus if you don't understand concavity. Now, that means if this is concave down and this is concave up, there's got to be an inflection point. You can't go from, you cannot change concavity without having an inflection point. Where do you think it is here? Right at zero. Yeah. Remember what this function is. f of x equals x cubed. So f prime of x equals 3x squared, and f double prime of x equals 6x. Well, notice at this point right there, what's the second derivative equal to? X is equal to M. Plug in the x value into the function for the second derivative. What do you get? Zero. Yeah. So the inflection point is at zero. The inflection point of the original function is at zero. That's where the concavity changes. And that's the definition of where you find the inflection point. So we can go from that to the following. If I give you a function Give me the first derivative. B 3x squared minus 4x plus 3. Give me the second derivative. B 6x minus 4. Where's the inflection point on the original function? What's true about the second derivative when we are in the inflection point? The, wait, the second derivative? Second derivative is equal to zero, right? 
So you set the second derivative equal to zero and solve that equation, you get x equals two-thirds. That's where the inflection point is on the Wait, original. Isn't it, isn't it negative two-thirds? No. Moving the four over becomes oh, yeah. dividing by six. I got four-sixths reduces to two-thirds. But if somebody says, where is the inflection point on the original function, well, I know it's right there. And the original function probably looks, if I go to x equal two-thirds, I know I'm going to have an inflection point there. So my function might look something like this. Positive or concave down, concave down, concave down, concave up. So this might be my original function. It's got two extrema, which match a cubic. Remember, a cubic can only have, at most, two local extrema. A cortic can only have three, always one less than the highest degree. Well, right there is where that concavity changes. From concave down to concave up. And I found this point by taking the second derivative of the function. In other words, I did it entirely algebraically. And there's only two concavities in that function. There's concave down from negative infinity to two-thirds, and it's concave up from two-thirds to positive infinity. Okay? Okay. All right. Now let's go back to your stuff. So what's the concavity of F on the intervals where F prime is increasing? Well, when F prime is increasing, what is true about F double prime? Positive or negative? Double prime? Uh, Remember, f double prime is the first derivative of the first derivative. So pretend that f prime is the function and f double prime is its first derivative. When the function is increasing, what is true about the next derivative? It's positive. Okay. So whenever f prime was increasing, the second derivative was positive, right? Yeah. Positive means concave up. Negative means concave down. So whenever f prime is increasing, that means f double prime is positive, which means the function is concave up. Well, f prime was increasing from minus 5 to about 3 and a half. Well, guess what? From minus 5 to 3 and a half, that's concave up. Do you see why? Notice, yeah, the curve, up. notice the curvature at the lower left. That points up. So it's concave up for the second derivative. No. We're talking about the original function. We're talking about the concavity of the original function. You usually are wanting to answer questions about the original function. Like I want to know where a maximum is. Gosh, it looks like there's a maximum at x equal minus 2. It looks like there's another maximum at x equal 2. And then I got three places here where the derivative is 0. At minus 2, 0, and plus 2. For me to figure out which of those are maximums and which of them are minimums, I need to figure out concavity. So I need to figure out the concavity at minus 2. And I do that by evaluating the second derivative. The second derivative is going to be negative. Because I'm concave down right there. You see where my cursor is pointing? That's concave down. 
This is concave up. You see where I'm pointed now? Yeah. So somewhere in between there, about there, is where it changes. That's where it goes from being concave up to concave down, and that's where the second derivative would be equal to zero. It's right where I'm pointed. Now, we're concave down, concave down, concave down, concave down until I get right there and it looks like my concavity is getting ready to change to concave up. So there's another inflection point where I'm pointing now. Now it's concave up, concave up, concave up, and I reach a point over here where it's getting ready to change to concave down. Another inflection point there. So this concavity stuff is really important. Concave down, concave down, about here. What is it here where I'm pointing? What's the concavity there? Concave up. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether the line stops there or not. It's still concave up that whole way. It's concave up from this inflection point to the end just like it was concave up over here from the far left to the inflection point. And that's why the first derivative is increasing that entire segment from minus 5 to about minus 3 and 2 thirds or so. So that's why 6 is asking you to note the concavity of f, the original function, during the intervals where the first derivative is increasing. This stuff is complicated, Zach. There's just no two ways around it, and it's really hard to absorb. You just kind of have to keep at it, and eventually it'll all sink in and you'll get it. It's terrifically complicated because, wow, you're talking about three different functions, original function, first derivative, and second derivative, and you're talking about increasing as opposed to positive and inflection points. It's just a lot to grasp. Just keep at it. And we'll keep working on it, and you'll get it. Okay? Now, where is the graph of F concave down? Base it on uh, f prime. It'd be, words, it's going to be concave down whenever f prime is decreasing, right? Because when f prime is decreasing, f double prime is negative. Based on our rules for f, f prime, if your original function or if a function is decreasing, then its derivative is negative, always. doesn't matter whether you call it f or f prime or f quadruple prime. When you take the next derivative, if the previous one is decreasing, then the derivative of this function is going to be negative wherever it's decreasing. And remember what a negative second derivative means. It means concave down. So as f prime decreases from this point here to this point here, f double prime is negative that whole way, and that means the original function is concave down that whole way. Well, we can see that. We see that from there to there, it's concave down. And then from minus 1 to it looks like about 1, it's concave up. Well, if we look at minus 1, to 1 on the first derivative, it's increasing from minus 1 to 1. That means the second derivative is positive. Positive goes with concave up. That's the main thing you want to remember, is that a second derivative that's positive goes with a function that's concave up. A second derivative that's negative goes with a function that's concave down. 
So by the second derivative test, you can figure out concavity. You don't have to do it visually. You can do it by taking the second derivative of the function. Now, with this particular problem, they don't give us the function, so we can't do it algebraically. But it's important that you be able to do it algebraically as well as visually. And that's why I love this graph, because this lets you do it visually. Notice where the original function is concave down, the second derivative is negative. All, all in here is negative. That corresponds to where the original function is concave down. Now look where the original function is concave up. That corresponds to where the second derivative is positive. Not increasing, but positive. Make sure you always distinguish between those two words. That, to me, is the most confusing thing about the visual nature of, gra of calculus, is that one tends to look at this first derivative here and think that that's negative. It's not. That's positive. That's in positive territory. It's decreasing, but it's in positive territory. All right. Let's see what other questions we got here. So we've been through 7. We can figure out where the graph of f is concave down because that's where the first derivative is decreasing. What is the behavior of f prime on these intervals? I need to get my charger. Give me a second. <laughs> Just gave me a battery alert. Oh, okay. For your, for what? For the, for the uh, laptop. Yeah. So you need to plug it in. Yeah, it's in now. Okay, we're good. <laughs> this is a little tough because it's hard to see the curves and the questions at the same time. So we answered 7. Let's talk about 8. What is the behavior, and by that they mean, is it increasing or decreasing on f prime on the intervals where we were concave down on f? What's f prime doing when we are concave down on f? It's decreasing? No, it's increasing. Concave down on F from about minus 4 to about minus 1, right? Yeah. Excuse me. F prime is positive. It's not whether it's increasing or decreasing. It's whether it's... Oh, it is asking about increasing or decreasing on those intervals. Well, I'm not sure what intervals it's actually referring to is the problem with all of these questions. They don't make it real clear that question 8 is referring to the intervals from question 6, or is it referring to the intervals from question 7? I think it's from question 7. Okay. So, whenever F the original function is concave down. We know that the second derivative is negative, right? And if the second derivative is negative, the first derivative must be decreasing. So whenever f is concave down, the first derivative has to be decreasing. Well, that's actually correct. Notice that the first derivative is increasing only on this interval here where we're concave up. Then the first derivative turns around and starts decreasing, and over that entire interval we're concave down. That's from this point here to this point here, minus 1. 
over the entire interval where the original function is concave down, the first derivative is decreasing, and vice versa. Wherever the original function is concave up, like between minus 1 and 1, the first derivative is increasing from minus 1 to 1. So there's that relationship with concavity and first derivative. There's not only a relationship between concavity and second derivative, but there's a relationship between concavity and first derivative. Whenever you're concave down, first derivative is decreasing. Whenever you're concave up, first derivative is increasing. What does f take on local maximum, where does f take on local maximum values? f, where are the local maximums? Um, 3, or, or no, negative 2 and 2. Correct. Where's the local minimums? 0. Correct. Now, you know the difference between local and absolute? Uh, absolute is like the like lowest or biggest of like well, all of them. Zero is a local minimum, but it's not an absolute minimum. I can find a point over here that's lower than where it is. And I can find a point over here that's lower where it is. The reason it's called a local minimum is because immediately to the left and immediately to the right, it's bigger than that point. That's what means concave up. In other words, that is a local minimum. That's a local maximum, but it's also an absolute maximum. There's no place on the function that's higher than that. Same with over there. But notice what is true at these local minimums and maximums. What is true about the first derivative? What's its value? Just look at the curve. Look at the function f and draw tangent lines at those points. What's the slope of those tangent lines? All three of them. Zero. Yeah. That's one of the most important things you can grasp about calculus is that when you have local minimums or maximums, the first derivative is always zero there because it's always a flat. You cannot go from increasing to decreasing without having a point where my first derivative is horizontal. My slope of the tangent line is horizontal. You can't do it. Not if the function is continuous. Now, let's talk about continuity for a second. In other words, I cannot switch directions without creating a tangent line that is horizontal. The moment I go from increasing to decreasing, there has to be a point there that has a horizontal tangent. So as all I have to do is search for where the first derivative is zero, that gives me my local maximum. Very important thing to be able to find is your local maximum. Now, if I have a function that looks like this, that's continuous, but it's got what is called a cusp or a corner. It is not differentiable at that spot. There is no tangent line at that point. I would not know how to draw the slope of the tangent line there. Is the slope of the tangent line like that? Is it like this? Is it like that? Is it like this? There is no derivative at these points. And you get lots of functions that have points like this, like the absolute value function, right? y equals square root of, excuse me, y equal absolute value of x is such a function. 
It's continuous, but it is not differentiable at all across x. It's differentiable everywhere but right there at zero because that's a corner or a cusp. Let me draw some other graphs that have corners in them or cusps. Not differentiable there. Have no idea. Not only is it not differentiable, but I would have no idea how to draw the slope of the tangent line there. One other situation I want to point out to you before I let you go. Notice that with this function, y equal x cubed, I have a point here, right there, that if I were to draw the tangent line, it would be flat, right? Yet, yeah. yet it does not represent a local maximum or local minimum. For something to be a local maximum or minimum, it has to pass the first derivative test where the slopes have to change. Notice my slopes are plus, 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 zero, plus, plus, plus. If they do not change, then that point is not a local maximum or minimum, as opposed to if I have this, the slopes go from plus, 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 zero, minus, minus, minus. So if the slopes about your extrema go from plus to minus, it's a local maximum. If it goes from minus to plus, it's a local minimum. So you can't just find where the first derivative is equal to zero, <coughs> because here the first derivative is equal to zero gives you a tangent line that's horizontal. But it's not a local minimum or maximum. So just because first derivative is zero does not mean you necessarily have a maximum or a minimum. Has the slopes have to change sides, have to change signs when you go from one side of that point to the other. All right, Zach, our hour is up. You've experienced my online. I appreciate it tremendously that you were willing to do this. It makes my day far more acceptable. Uh, gives me a little 30-minute window here that I can have some dinner. So I appreciate it, and you're perfectly willing to go back to in-person. I have no problem with it from this point on. So I will plan on in-person at our normal time unless you tell me otherwise. If you like online just as much as in-person, it's cheaper for your mom. It's only 32 bucks an hour instead of 40 Also might be a little more valuable to you because this whole session is recorded. If there's something you didn't understand, you can go back and check what I said. You can't do that in person. And there is nothing that we can do in person that we can't do in an online session. Nothing. If you have problems, take a picture, send me the problems. Then we do it. Okay? Okay. Okay, so our next appointment is, let me just check this before I leave you. Our next appointment is Thursday at 6.30. Yep. Oh, you know what? I'd like to make that at... No, that'll, that'll work. That'll work just fine. Thursday at 6.30, I'll see you at your house. Okay. All right, Zach. Have a good one. Bye-bye.